Ten, the igniters have been lit. Nine, eight, seven, six. Five, four, three, two, one. And liftoff at dawn. The dawn of Orion and a new era of American space exploration. This is Orion, NASA's next generation deep space exploration vehicle. Built for deep space, Orion is the only spacecraft capable of keeping its astronaut occupants alive and safe at the moon. But getting there is the hard part. Clocking in at nearly 26.5 metric tons, Orion is quite heavy. As such, there's only one rocket on Earth capable of sending that much payload to the moon. The Space Launch System. The Space Launch System, or SLS, is NASA's new super heavy lift mega rocket, designed from the ground up to carry Orion to the moon. However, the SLS that will send Orion to the moon on the Artemis 1 mission is quite small compared to the monster Saturn V. The initial version of the SLS, known as the SLS Block 1, is powered by two massive solid rocket boosters. Each booster consists of five segments, many of which are being reused from space shuttle flights and provide SLS with 3.6 million pounds of thrust apiece, for a combined total of 7.2 million pounds of thrust. At liftoff, these five-segment SRBs will become the most powerful rocket motors ever flown. The backbone of the SLS rocket is its gigantic core stage. Weighing nearly 94 tons and at a length of 212 feet, it is the largest rocket stage NASA has ever built. Powered by four RS-25D main engines, which are being reused from the shuttle program, the SLS core stage produces 1.6 million pounds of thrust when it lights up on the pad and does not stop burning until it reaches orbit, a full eight minutes long. The Launch Vehicle Stage Adapter, or LVSA, is a conical adapter used to connect the 8.4 meter wide core stage to the 5 meter wide upper stage. The upper stage of the SLS Block 1 is known as the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage. It is essentially a 5 meter wide Delta Cryogenic second stage whose tanks have been extended slightly to accommodate enough fuel to send Orion to the moon. The final part of the Block 1 SLS is known as the Orion Stage Adapter. This small adapter is used to connect the 5 meter ICPS to the 5.5 meter Orion stack and is also used to house up to 13 CubeSats as secondary payloads. Combined, these parts will produce a rocket nearly 322 feet tall taller than the Statue of Liberty. While this might seem huge, NASA wants to go bigger, much bigger. Bigger even than the Saturn V. At 322 feet tall, the SLS Block 1 is the smallest configuration of the SLS rocket. It can lift up to 95 metric tons to low Earth orbit and send 27 metric tons on a translunar injection. This version of the rocket is slated to fly for the first three Artemis missions. The projected cost of these first three missions will be nearly $2 billion per launch. The reason being that these launches are paid for by a developmental contract in which only two vehicles were paid for. The third vehicle is being paid for under what is known as a continuing resolution. A continuing resolution is a sort of interim contract that allows the Michoud assembly facility to continue working uninterrupted while the next contract is finalized. This price, however, is expected to fall drastically in the next contract which will not be a developmental contract, but a production contract. This contract will purchase an additional 10 rockets, and as such, the cost per launch is expected to fall from $2 billion per launch to $876 million per launch, half the cost of the Saturn V. This production contract won't be for the SLS Block 1, however. It will be for a much larger and improved configuration of the rocket known as the SLS Block 1B. This upgrade to the SLS rocket will replace the LVSA, the ICPS, and the OSA with much bigger versions of each. The orange tapered LVSA of the Block 1 will be replaced by a white cylindrical stage adapter for the Block 1B. The small OSA will be replaced by a huge 8.4 meter payload fairing known as the Universal Stage Adapter, or USA. But the biggest and most important change of all is that of the ICPS, which will get replaced by a gigantic 8.4 meter wide stage known as the Exploration Upper Stage, or EUS. At 364 feet tall, the SLS Block 1B configuration is taller than the legendary Saturn V. It can lift up to 105 metric tons to low Earth orbit and send 45 tons on a translunar injection. But the biggest feature with the SLS Block 1B is that it can still send 11 tons of payload to the moon 
with Orion and a crew of four astronauts. Enough payload fraction for a sizable space station module. This is what NASA really wants, a rocket capable of sending astronauts and space station components to the moon to construct the Lunar Gateway. The Lunar Orbiting Platform Gateway, or just Gateway for short, will be NASA's newest space station. This new space station will orbit the moon in what is known as a near rectilinear halo orbit, or an NRHO, and will be the primary base of operations for all crewed Artemis missions. But even at half the cost of the Saturn V, one may question why we shouldn't just use commercial launchers to build the Lunar Gateway. After all, a Falcon Heavy will be sending the first two modules up to the NRHO in 2023. Why use the SLS Block 1B at all? Well, this situation with the Falcon Heavy is a very unique one. The Falcon Heavy isn't actually sending these two modules to the moon, it is sending them to a geostationary transfer orbit. The only reason it can do this is because one of the modules is the Power and Propulsion Element, or PPE. The PPE has its own onboard propellant and guidance systems which will allow it to get to the moon with the second module from a geostationary transfer orbit. But the biggest reason for using the SLS Block 1B comes down to Orion. The Orion spacecraft weighs nearly 26.5 metric tons, meaning that only an SLS rocket can send it to the moon. So no matter what you do, SLS rockets will have to fly even if only as a crew transport. The SLS launch of crew costs $876 million on its own, so if NASA were to also purchase a $150 million Falcon Heavy flight to send a module to the moon, the total cost to send the crew and the module to the moon would increase to $1.026 billion. This is where the SLS Block 1B comes in. If we, instead of purchasing a separate launcher, just put the module in the payload bay of the SLS, we could decrease the cost to get the crew and the module to the moon by $150 million. And this works not just for modules, but for anything NASA or one of its partners might want to send to the moon. Co-manifesting payloads is not a new revelation, however. In fact, many of NASA's previous rockets have also co-manifested their own payloads. Famously, the Saturn V co-manifested the lunar module for the Apollo flights. And even the Saturn 1B has launched payloads co-manifested in its payload bay. This is where the docking adapter for the Apollo Soyuz test project was kept. But by far the most famous of all was the Space Shuttle, whose huge payload bay allowed for gigantic payloads of up to 29 metric tons to be placed into low Earth orbit, as well as carrying up to 7 astronauts for 17 days per mission. And even in the commercial sector, co-manifesting payloads is not uncommon. Perhaps the most famous example of which being the Ariane 5, who has a special secondary payload fairing that can enclose one payload while another payload sits above it. If an SLS is already going to the moon, it will be cheaper to fly cargo as a co-manifested payload than it will be to purchase a separate launcher. This is the key to SLS's success, its ability to co-manifest massive payloads in its payload bay. From its conception after the cancellation of the Constellation program, the SLS rocket has always had one goal in mind. Returning humans to deep space. Sure, it has seen no shortage of challenges and setbacks, but at the end of the day, the SLS program has pressed through to the very end. From navigating the ever-changing political landscape of Washington to firing up its core stage for a solid eight minutes, this program has been through a lot. And we are now beginning to see the light at the end of the tunnel. The first mission is mere months away from launching, and the first crewed mission is gearing up to fly only a year and a half after that. There are certainly lots of differing opinions surrounding SLS. Is it good? Is it bad? Should we keep it? Should we cancel it? But there is one thing that seemingly every person agrees on. The launch of the first mission will truly be a sight to behold. And with that first launch, we will see the end of a half century long gap in lunar exploration and the beginning of a new era in human spaceflight. Not to plant flags or leave footprints, but to stay and explore Earth's nearest neighbor in preparation for a trip to another world. And this new era of exploration will be pioneered by the Space Launch System, NASA's mightiest rocket.